Welcome back to Deep Learning. So today I want to talk to you about the actual pooling implementation. The pooling layers are one essential step in many deep networks. The main idea behind this is that you want to reduce the dimensionality across the spatial domain. So here we see the small example where we summarize the information in the green rectangles, the blue rectangles, the yellow and the red ones to only one value. So we have a two by two input that has to be mapped to a single value. Now this, of course, reduces the number of parameters. It introduces a hierarchy and allows you to work with spatial abstraction. Furthermore, it reduces computational cost and overfitting. We need some basic assumptions, of course, here. And of course, one of the assumptions is that the features are hierarchically structured. By pooling, we are reducing the output size and introduce this hierarchy that should be intrinsically present in the signal. We talked about the eyes being composed of edges and lines and faces, a composition of eyes and mouth. This has to be present in order to make pooling a sensible operation to be included in your network. Here you see a pooling layer of three by three and we choose max pooling. So in max pooling, only the highest number of a receptor field will actually be propagated into the output. Obviously, we can also work with larger strides. Typically, the stride equals the neighborhood size, such that we can get one output per receptor field. The problem here is, of course, that the maximum operation adds an additional nonlinearity, and therefore we also have to think about how to resolve this step in the gradient procedure. Essentially, we use again the concept of the subgradient, where we simply propagate into the cell that has produced the maximum output. So you could say, the winner takes it all. Now, an alternative to this is average pooling. Here we compute simply the average over the neighborhood. However, it does not consistently perform better than max pooling. In the backpropagation pass, the error is simply shared in equal parts and backpropagated to the respective units. There are many more pooling strategies like fractional, max pooling, LP pooling, stochastic pooling, spatial pyramid pooling, generalized pooling, and many more. There's a whole different set of strategies about this. Two alternatives that we already talked about are the strided and Atrus convolutions. This became really popular because then you don't have to encode the max pooling as an additional step and you reduce the number of parameters. Typically, people now use strided convolutions with s greater than 1 in order to implement convolution and pooling at the same time. So let's recap what our convolutional neural networks are doing. We talked about the convolution producing feature maps and the pooling reducing the size of the respective feature maps. Then again, convolutions and pooling until we end up at an abstract representation. Finally, we had these fully connected layers in order to do the classification. Actually, we can kick out this last block because we've seen that if we replace this with a reformatting into channel direction, then we can replace it with a one by one convolution. Subsequently, we just apply this to get our final classification. Hence, we can reduce the number of building blocks further. We don't even need fully connected layers anymore. Now everything then becomes fully convolutional and we can express essentially the entire chain of operations by convolutions and pooling steps. So we don't even need fully connected layers anymore. The nice thing about the one by one convolutions is if you combine this with something that is called global average pooling, then you can essentially also process input images of arbitrary size. So the idea here is then at the end of the convolutional processing, you simply map into the channel direction and compute the global average 
for all of your inputs. This works because you have a predefined global pooling operation. Then you can make this applicable to images of arbitrary sizes. So again, we benefit from the ideas of pooling and convolution. An interesting concept that we will also have a look at in more detail later in this lecture is the inception model. This approach is from the paper Going Deeper with Convolutions, reference 8. Following our self-stated motto, we need to go deeper. This network won the ImageNet Challenge 2014. An example is GoogleNet as one incarnation, which is inspired by reference number 4. The idea that they presented tackles the problem of having to fix the steps of convolution and pooling in alteration. Why not allow the network to learn on its own when it wants to pool and when it wants to convolve? So the main idea is that you put in parallel 1x1 one one convolution, 3x3 three three convolution, 5x5 five five convolution and max pooling. Then you just concatenate them. Now the interesting thing is that if you offer all those four operations in parallel, that the next layer can then choose what input to trust most in order to construct the deep network. If you do this, then you can further expand this, for example, at the 3x3 and 5x5 convolutions. You may want to compress the channels first because you actually evaluate them. Then you find the configuration here on the right hand side. This incorporates additional dimensionality reduction. Still, this parallel processing allows you to have a network to learn on its own the sequence of pooling and convolution layers. Because of self-improvement, um, that is really the pinnacle of that, where you uh, then not only learn uh, how to improve on that problem and on that, but you also improve the way the machine improves, and you also improve the way it improves the way it improves itself. And that was my 1987 diploma thesis, which was all about that. Then you get models like this one. This is already a pretty deep model that features a lot of interesting further innovations that we will talk about when we are speaking about different network architectures. So next time in deep learning, we want to talk about how we can prevent networks just from memorizing the training data. Is there a way to force features to become independent? How can we make sure that our network also recognizes cats in different poses. Also a very nice recipe that can help you with that and how we can fix the internal covariate shift problem. I think these are all important points and I think these questions really deserve to be answered. I also have a couple of comprehensive questions or tasks. Name five activation functions, discuss those five activation functions, what is the zero centering problem? Write down a mathematical description of strided convolutions. What is the connection between one by one convolutions and fully connected layers? What is a pooling layer? Why do we need those pooling layers? So many interesting things that somebody could ask you in a written exam at a certain point in time. Of course, we have some additional references. And if you have any questions, you can post them in the comments or send them by mail. Of course, there are also plenty of references that we have shown to you in this video. And I hope you like this video and I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye bye.